Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Neil Romanowski. I'm the Dean of the Libraries. And if you're joining online, thanks for being here. I think we're having some video uh, trouble, but hopefully the audio is coming through loud and clear, and the slides uh, you should be able to see as well. Uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome you today um, to our graduate research series. Uh, this is collaboratively hosted by uh, the University Libraries, Graduate Student Senate, and Faculty Senate. And the series is a celebration um, of the research of graduate students and it explores both the actual research topic, but also importantly, the research process, and specifically how uh, the students utilize the library and other information resources in that process. The presenters for the series are selected by the Graduate uh, Research Series Committee, which is composed of um, people from the libraries as well as graduate student senate. And so this morning, I am very pleased to introduce to you Faustina Mensa, uh, a doctoral and master's candidate in counseling and higher education in the Patton College of Education. And Faustina's presentation, an appreciative inquiry of campus-based support programs for former foster youth pursuing post-secondary education in Ohio, explores her research about support programs available to college students who spent much of their childhood in foster care. Faustina has had over 15 years of varied professional experience, including uh, work as a high school teacher. She holds a bachelor's in uh, business education from the University of Cape Coast, Ghana, West Africa. She is a graduate alum of the Institute for Educational Planning and Administration at the University of Cape Coast and holds a Master of Philosophy in the Administration of Higher Education. And Faustina's academic interests include social justice, student achievement, and retention in higher education. Um, Faustina has uh, also been very actively involved in student leadership and advocacy here at Ohio, including being founder and chair of the COVID-19 International Student Tax Task Force, Vice President of the Golden Key International Honor Society, past president of the African Students' Union, member of the Provost International Opportunities Think Tank, current graduate student senate commissioner of equity and inclusion, and near and dear to our own hearts here at the library, is one of the founding members of the library's student advisory board. It's my pleasure to welcome Costina this morning. Thank you. Also, 
research has endorsed that there's so much struggle that our youth go through when they leave the system. And the term that is usually used is emancipation or they exit. And so they do go through so much struggle that negatively impacts their life. So narrowing it down to higher education. In higher education to one of the most cited primers on the experiences of foster youth is Bolani 2005. And through his research, he was able to establish that our federal TRIO and JR programs are not able to support our youth with our students with foster care background because of the lack of knowledge I told you about and also because of their peculiar challenges. And due to that, all, almost all the research was advocating for targeted services for post-secondary students who had you know, foster care backgrounds because they realized that campus support programming that were even targeted to students from low income, you know, generation, first generation college students were not adequately ensuring that our students were achieving the academic success we desired. As a matter of fact, according to the literature, um, retention is less than 3% of students with foster care background. They spend more time, you know, in college, over six years, and majority of them come into college on prepared. And so, with that being said, the good thing is that colleges in the United States have responded to that call, and they started introducing these college support programs. So we do have a good amount of them, but still, it's a new phenomenon, and there's still very little that is known about these support systems, and the literature shows that. And there's so much more um, required for, for research for us to understand what kinds of support systems are in place and how they look like. So how they are designed and how they are implemented. One thing that I found striking during my literature review when I started focusing on this topic too was that um, majority of the studies are quantitative in nature and, and it makes sense, right? And then they also focused on CSPs. When you hear me say CSP, that is couple support programs, right? They focus on the, the campus support programs that are doing well in Michigan, Washington, California has the largest, um, and no mention would you find in Ohio. So that's where I'm coming in. And also, one thing I found striking was that a lot of the literature were on student experiences. So I'm a higher education professional, so I started thinking, where are my people in these conversations? Why they are not giving voice to administrators who are taking care of our students, right? And then two, the literature is just predominant on the challenges students are having. Um, while in college, there are few that also highlight those who participated in the few CSPs and the successful ones. And so that actually dovetails into the significance of my step. And I already have mentioned why, but for me, there are so many reasons why it's important to focus on our students who have foster care backgrounds. The first being that they are often marginalized and forgotten on college campuses. And even research has labeled them as invisible. So with that being said, I want to make sure that we are projecting the experiences and making sure that we do not leave them behind. The second one is, I already mentioned this, um, literature confirms that about 80% of them desire to come to college, 45% of, 45 of them pursue college, but less than 10% of them are retained and graduate. So when you look at that statistic, please keep that in your mind. And also, as I already mentioned, a lot of the research has been skewed towards student experiences, administrators or high, um, college student personnel who are providing these support services have not been given the opportunity to also share their experiences. And lastly, also because it's a new phenomenon and as somebody who cares about human systems and organization systems, it is important for us to learn more about the design and implementation of these CSPs. And lastly, most of these designs have focused on challenges, it's been deficit-based, and as a strengths-based scholar, I wanted to also look at, you know, what is working well.
And so that ties into my purpose of the study, where I am using this qualitative, appreciative approach just to understand what is working well in terms of the kind of support we are providing students with foster care background. And so drawing from the appreciative inquiry framework, my central research question is what are the life-giving elements of campus support programs that serve students with foster care experience in post-secondary institutions in Ohio? So I'm using the appreciative inquiry um, approach. And for those of you who may not be familiar with appreciative inquiry, it could either be utilized as a research design or as a theoretical feature. So um, for Pokeranda and his peers who came up with the theory, in simple ways that I can explain the theory, they say, um, when you think of human systems, organization systems, when you focus on strength-based conversations, we become energized, right? But when the opposite, which we usually do, is when we are looking out for what are the faults, what are you not doing well. But with appreciative inquiry as a philosophy, it's focusing on what is working well. We do not ignore what the problems are, but the focus is on what is working well. The other thing that I like about appreciative inquiry or strength-based approaches is that it gives us the opportunity to reframe how we look at system problems, organization systems. And with that, it takes our minds off the negatives. So when you want to use appreciative inquiry, it's, the model is made up of four Ds. And most of the time, if you're using it as a research design, then you, it serves best if it's an action research. Because the third and the fourth D, which are blocked out, they move into where you have to partner with your participants to, to deliver, to actually design and implement what they dreamed about in the first two phases. And because I am not doing that, it serves better that I use it as a theoretical framework where I would just get to learn from my participants what aspects they see are valuable and what they imagine or envision as an ideal CSP for our students in post secondary institutions. And so for that reason is why I am just using the first two phases. I just put this up, I'm not gonna go into it, just for you to see how I drew my sub-questions from the framework so that I'll be able to make sure I'm staying in within my frame to answer my central research question. And so I will leave it up there for you to look at it, but the most important thing is I will be asking them what do they find as most valuable aspects of their CSPs, and then we will move into what they envision as an ideal CSP for our foster in post-secondary institution. And in terms of um, methodology, this is a qualitative exploratory case study. Um, I've already mentioned that I, my participants will be administrators who are providing these support services in post-secondary institutions in Ohio. And in terms of my main criteria for inclusion is that from the Ohio Department of Higher Education, since 2019, they partnered with Ohio Reach. And so now that's the state's program in terms of supporting foster youth in post-secondary in institutions. And on the Ohio Reach Network page, they have 14 institutions that are currently part of that network. And so I'm hoping to engage in these conversations with the administration, administrators from those institutions. For those of you who do not know, um, I just got my approval from our institutional review board, and that is why I am excited that I get to present, because most of the time, I feel that those of us who are still in the process, we get forgotten in this process. And so in terms of data collection and analysis, what I can best share with you now is what my plan is. And um, for qualitative case studies, it relies heavily on triangulation. I've had to do a lot of shifting because of access, which I'll be talking about later. 
but initially my plan is to use documents and conduct appreciative one-on-one -on -one interviews and observations. It's looking tricky with observations for now, and so I would think that um, I'm very flexible on that. But in terms of my analysis with the documents, I will be using guidance from Kali. Uh, she recommends a map analysis and map analysis approach, which what it does is I will be trying to make meaning from the doc information I'm gathering from the documents and not just the content analysis of the text. Um, with my appreciative interviews, I will be using Saldana as my guide. And then with the observations, as I said, I'm not even sure due to FEPA, and FEPA is Family Education Rights. Get it right? I always mix it. Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And students with foster care backgrounds are protected by FEPA. So you cannot do anything without making sure that you are not violating that act. So I'm very flexible on my observations for now. My hope at the end of the day is to present a single case report using the theory building approach where I will be pulling out themes to provide the description of the kind of support we are providing to our post-secondary students across the world. So I'm excited about that. That's about it with my research. And I think it's important I highlight this before I move into the next aspect of my presentation. And then I hope I'm doing well. Awesome. So I, I, want, I want to start off by letting you also know what, why, why I chose to focus on our youth with this background. It's because when I got admission to Ohio University, before I came actually, I decided I was going to devote my dissertation as a goodwill gesture back to the United States. And so I took that whole process a bit too seriously, I think. And I, I was really looking for something that would mean so much in terms of devoting my dissertation topic um, to give back. Also, as a scholar in training in higher education and student affairs, as I mentioned, the more I got to learn about students and the support systems, and I realized the literature, the background of the researchers from the literature I was reviewing were largely social work professionals. So I, I question where are my higher education people, and especially higher education and student affairs, because we are the custodians of students when they are in college. So I was worried that we were missing out the table and we were not partaking in these conversations. And, and also, um, I, I had to do some gatekeeper process in, in relation to my study, and in doing that, I realized that, thank you, I realized that there is a small number of higher education professionals who are trying to put the work out there. And so I'm proud that I am going to also be part of that small group. But most importantly, I'm proud that I will be contributing to the advocacy efforts when it comes to the kind of support systems we have in place for students with foster care experience. So this is my position going into my data flow. And I want to start the second part of my presentation with this quote. And I read, when considering writing a proposal for a research study that will use qualitative methods, it is valuable to weigh three interrelated concepts, do ability, should do ability, and want to do ability. And this is a quote from Marshall Rossman. And I start off with this because I have had big challenges in putting together my research proposal, mainly because of access, as I mentioned earlier, right? And so the feasibility of my research truly heavily um, impacted the sustained and sustaining interest piece. And I think it's important to share this because you understand everything I share moving on. And so I, I intentionally put this up so you have a fair idea of my process um, and what my research process has been through. And um, looking, depending on which side you're looking at it, when you look on the left side and you see all the challenges I have been through, I may not go through every one of them though, but my pre-dissertation phase, as I mentioned, I, I took 
that um, commitment a bit too serious. So I kept changing topics because I didn't feel like, you know, this is not good enough. And so that was a challenge. And then on the right side, or for me now it's my left side though, you see the library services that I utilize, right? And if you take a close look at them, as a matter of fact, if I'm to draw a Venn diagram, subjects librarians will be in the middle. And I'm going to talk a lot about subjects librarians today. I gave Dr. Gooden heads up and a warning, so um, it's coming. But yes, um, I will start with cultural understanding and linguistic and technical challenges because the others are straightforward or they are intertwined. So for those of you who do not know, I come from Ghana and English is our first language. So when you see linguistic there, please just have that context in mind as well. But I use cultural understanding in the sense that I have not had any personal um, experience with foster care system. Everything I knew about foster care was what I had read from the literature. And so when I started and at a point where I decided this was going to be my focus, I actually did not realize how not having that cultural perspective will impact my ability to craft my research story. So that was a big challenge. And I, I was going round and round and round in circles. And furthermore, with that challenge, I was having challenges being able to know what keywords to search for. So I couldn't find you know, literature to even further move myself forward. So as a result of that, I had to spend about one year with the gatekeeper process. And for those of you who are not familiar, in simple terms, gatekeeper was finding people who might end up being my participants, talking to them, and asking whether they would be willing to participate with my state. And so I did that, and it was helpful. Um, but then the other pieces was the scholarly piece, you know, where I, I had challenges in figuring it out. And that's where our library services, honestly, in terms of meeting with subjects librarians and using all the other services came into me. And, and let me also say this. I got to this space very prepared. My college, my department, higher education and student affairs, educational research and evaluation, they did prepare me well. I have taken over 60 hours of methodology classes, and that's a full PhD on its own. Well. So I just want you to have that perspective in mind as well. And so that moves into my favorite slide, which is about my Alvin story. And I say, when it comes to the resources, yes, I have used them, all, and I continue to use them. So if you're a graduate student listening to me, and you are not utilizing it, you're missing out on something. But I have outlined them just to highlight some of the experiences I've had. And I've attended workshops, even way before I needed them. And one of my favorite workshops was the one on data management. If you've not watched it, I think I saw the recording on the website. Please go watch it. Super helpful. Made me think about things a bit more critically, things I wasn't considering in terms of data management. We have a live chat feature as well, which I utilize helps me solve my problems almost instantaneously. So think about that. As I said, the scholarly materials, everything about student support services and foster youth is new. And so the literature predominantly is, is also relatively I recently needed a book that was published in 2021, couldn't find it, but thankfully Dr. Buddha was able to help me um, order that book and I'm grateful for that. And even the study spaces. It may see my name, but yes, please. You can scan, you can print, you know. Something that I don't think even the library leader should think about, but for me, you know, as grad students, we're doing this full time. So you have no limitations with your time you spend doing school work. You're here at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and sometimes you find yourself in a building by yourself. It's scary. But I always use the library when I'm out in those wee hours because there's going to be somebody to help you and there's going to be other students as well. So it, it is also um, an icon of safety for me. 
Now moving into the writing pieces. Zotero. So, um, I was one of those students who came in and I said, well, I, in my master's degree, I manually did my citation. So, those of you who are not familiar with uh, Zotero, it's a citation reference system, right? Electronic system. So I was one of those students, and I, I said, yeah, I did my first two years doing all my citations manually. And then a fellow doctoral student recommended I try one of these electronic systems. I, I tried Mendeley, it didn't work for me. It works for some people. And then um, I said, okay, I, I will try Zotero. I didn't even know we had um, tutorial videos on the library website. And so it was during a consultation that Dr. Buddha shared that link with me. So I was able to use that link to teach myself how to use the term. And it has been my lifesaver since then, right? I worry about the content and I, I allow Zotero to worry about the references. Um, I would also want to say that if you more watch the videos, please do them. Bootcamp, yes, this is another um, life-saving <laughs> event that I participated in, but which I know was a collaboration between the library and graduate college. And so shout out to Dr. Kelly, Dr. Becky, and Dr. Cynthia, you know, um, for putting it together and organizing it. I'll be honest with you all, as I mentioned, 2021 was my hardest year. And it was my hardest year for so many years. But the biggest of it was I was exhausted um, from the gatekeeper process. Um, for those of you who also didn't know, uh, my cohort is the 2018 cohort in the HESA program. Omar who presented is my, on Tuesday is my academic buddy. He's far ahead of me. And we even graduated one, one of our, our peers. So shout out to you, Dr. Gaskell. And if you ask any of my professors, I am proud to say I am not a slacker in class. I work hard. And so, you know, the issue with access that Marshall and Rossman talk about, seeing how it impacted my sustained interest. I was almost at a point of thinking, will I ever finish? I was at a point of thinking, do I have to change? And I was almost going to change my topic. And so um, I just didn't have any energy. And thankfully, I signed up for the 2021 Good Camp. And I came out energized. I connected with students who were at different levels, but we could share resources. And so um, I bring this up eventually just to show that the the dissertation writing phase is just so isolating, mm -hmm. it's so tasking, and there are different forms of motivation that culminate into the research and creative activity you see. But once again, you know, those of us going through it, it comes across as if you're wallowing or you're not doing the work, but in actual fact, it's just everything, those three considerations that Marsha and Rossman talk about that could be putting you back and it has nothing to do with your commitment to your research and scholarship. And yes, the graduate research series, right? And um, since I learned about it in 2019, I have been following it, I participate, I've learned, and I wanted to be honest. So this, this is a dream come true that I get to participate in it this year. And I may talk a little bit more about subjects like this. And I told Dr. Buddha to get ready. For those of you who don't know Dr. Buddha, he is our subject librarian for education. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. But the biggest thing is that throughout the process, when I was struggling and I didn't know what to do, and I was going around and around in circles, I would always book an appointment and go for consultation. I don't know if the library gathers you know, data on student interactions, because if they do, I should fall within the top five who put consultations <laughs> with Dr. Buddha. And, and I say this to the point where our faculty recommend that we talk about our research, right? I'll be honest with you, 
no grad students who meet a fellow grad student and we want to talk about this. We have too much venting to do that <laughs> we don't want to talk about research. But I appreciate the space that our library leadership and our institution have created that you can go to an expert, you know, of some sort and have these conversations. And I bring this up for one key reason. When preparing for this presentation, I was trying hard to remember what it was. But I remember there was a time, and that was a defining moment for me in crystallizing what I wanted to do. I, I was having a consultation with Dr. Buddha, and I realized the follow-up questions he was asking me wasn't really aligning with what I thought I was saying. So I asked him why he was asking me those follow-up questions. And it had to do with the key phrase. And he said, because in higher education, and I don't remember what that phrase is, that phrase could have multiple meanings. And honestly, that was a key defining moment. Because I think I was going round and round, and I kept saying that, and I was getting everybody confused. And then I even realized, probably through my gatekeeper process, I was getting a similar reaction. Right, and, and so I mentioned this just to also emphasize. The same way when you are not feeling well, you go to the hospital. For me, for research, I say our subject librarians are my 911 or SOS. And I'm bringing this up also for grad students who are not utilizing these services. I'm, I'm, I, have, I have met with other subject librarians as well. I've met with Hannah when I needed guidance on systematic reviews. I've met with Antaraba when I needed help when I was writing a paper on Ghana. And they wouldn't turn you away. So for grad students who are going into disciplinary research, you know, feel comfortable to schedule um, with our subjects like this. I They tell us during orientation, but honestly, we forget about it. And I want to use this opportunity to give a big shout out to my um, college, Patton College of Education, because all my faculty are taking over 15 methodology classes in the past three, four years, right? All my faculty bring in our subjects librarians. So they are the ones who make us care about it. I bring this up also so that faculty in other colleges, if you are not encouraging or bringing in the subjects librarians so it's on the mind of students, please read. Think about it and add that to your course content. Um, and then, lastly, yes, I want to end on a note of well-being. Uh, I think that we take that uh, for granted a lot of the time, or some of us may not even know that during finals week, the library has some well-being stuff going on. I come in for. Um, Button making, or I come to pick up a care pack to go do some coloring. And I know sometimes they bring down emotional support friends so that you can come and pet. So look out for these things. School is hard, friends. School is hard. So if there are little things that you can do just to ease your mind, you have no idea. We have all these resources. And I realize that we don't utilize it, especially my international students, friends. I do a lot of peer support. I realize. We don't have subjects librarians at the back of our mind. I realize they don't even know how to or where to schedule them. So I'm, I'm a big advocate to encourage students. They do a good job asking us questions and helping us read things through our research focus. I brought this up so I won't forget to talk about this. Those of you who do not know our library, we have seven floors. And um, I went up to the seventh floor and I, I realized actually that's the floor we have our thesis and dissertations. And I didn't know they have these fun chairs, I don't know what they are called. But instead of me to focus on what I went to do, I just went to sit and roll around for a while. Uh, and so if you do not know and you just need something to sit and roll around, just decide to go up to the seventh floor. But also I bring this up so that my um, peers who have children, that's the same floor where we have children's collections. So you can take them up there. It is a pine space though. But you can take them up there, um, go, go do some reading, but also have some fun seating areas. 
I also added this just so you know there's so many ways we as students can interact with the library. I always say that as a student at Ohio University, I am blessed to have the library on my laptop, right? And in so many modalities, you can even send a text message for help. So please think about it when you go to the um, help page, you have all of this. If you need an ambassador, I, I am willing to do that. <laughs> but yeah, um, with that being said, I, I cannot honestly close out. I cannot close out without extending a heart of gratitude to everybody who has been in part of my journey. It's been four years. I came with so much energy, but definitely by my second mark, my second year mark, you know, I was exhausted. And I was almost hitting a point of feeling I didn't have what it took to move forward. But it's taking, you know, um, academic and administrative advisors and mentors who keep reminding me what and who I am made up of. It's taking family, friends, peers, the university community at large, Athens community at large, that I am still here, you know. Uh, and also, most importantly, for today, the focus is on Alden services and the support I have gotten by all support services that we have on campus. I don't think I will still be standing. I don't think I will be here today if I didn't have the support. Um, I, I have this up here just to also reemphasize that for those of you who are not familiar with research on graduate retention, you know, especially doctoral students, right? We, attrition happens largely during the dissertation writing phase. And the literature shows that it is not an issue of ability, but most of the time it's the social isolation. And motivation does come in different forms. And I, once again, want to say a big thank you to the committee for giving me the opportunity to represent students who do not have the flamboyant data to, to share yet, but also to show that this is the process that every graduate student who puts together a research process goes through. You know, it's not easy. We don't get to talk about it all the time. Hardly do you get to celebrate us during this phase, but it is the most critical phase to us being able to go collect that data and come share with you. So I also share this so that faculty who are supporting grad students have this at the back of their mind. You don't hear from a student, you don't think they are just wallowing and deciding not to care. It could be any of those three considerations Marsha and Ross might talk about. To my peers, you know, I did mention subjects like being and so on, but I also want to say when you go into these consultations, they are not going to solve your problems for you. So please go in present. It took my observation of the follow-up questions Dr. Guda was asking for me to realize there was a mismatch. So if you go into these consultations thinking they're going to solve your problems for you, that's not going to happen. And so, yes, once again, to everybody who's been part of my world, I just want you to know I'm still standing. I'm not giving up on myself, neither am I giving up on you. And so, whatever you do for me, it does make a huge difference. Thank you. We already have a question in, from our online audience. Fauci, bear with me while I scroll up and read it to you. Um, this is from Mary Magdalene. She says, I might have missed you saying this, but would you, I would like to know what provisions you have made for obstacles in the process of your research. Uh, for example, when I filed for IRB, I mentioned that my participants won't be given any compensation so as to maintain the integrity of the responses they give. However, when I got to the field, I realized that my participants could not afford to miss out certain number of hours of work just to sit with me without being given anything to supplement the work they were missing. I had to quickly re-strategize and figure out a way to compensate without com without it coming directly from me, so that it doesn't look like I'm trying to take advantage or taking advantage of them. Excuse me. 
This is just one example of how plans can change and how IRB does not provide for certain circumstances. And getting approvals for any changes might take long, yet you're in the field. Do you foresee any such challenges in the field and how might you plan to solve them? Thank you, Mary, for that question. And I actually did. I just came out of one of those challenges. So my initial, my initial plan was to focus only on institutions that had established you know, campus support programs. And using the list on the Ohio Reach Network, only four institutions in Ohio have targeted services. The others are different. So Wright State University, Cleveland State, Columbus Community, and Ohio State. So when I set up my design, my initial plan was to talk to administrators in those four institutions. When I put in my application for IRB, that's what I stated. I had no idea that I would need letters of support from these four institutions. I submitted my application, I think, in April, and the whole of summer went by, and these schools wouldn't get back to me. And at a point, I, I didn't know what to do, but I think it could be fair power to me, right? Because they cannot just out of their own accord say, yes, I spoken to them during the gatekeeper process. They had given me their work. And now I needed the letters of support, and it took how many months? Six months. My IRB was just sitting there. So then, once again, one positive outcome that came out of the boot camp was I've been having accountability visitation hours with, with a friend, and anytime you go for these meetings, you have to come with a goal for your visitation. And so this semester, it was through that process, I was forced to think hard how to move beyond that. And then I eventually had my aha moment. So I said, well, if I'm going to focus on these schools and not get letters of support, why don't I just open up the call to all administrators who form part of the Ohio Roots Network? And praise Jesus, that's how come eventually I got my IRB. So thank you for that question. Yes, I have waited on this. and. I was supposed to use fall to collect data in your you know, so now that alone, even time-wise, so you're so right. In terms of compensation, thankfully, just having conversations during the boot camp and follow-up conversations, you know, um, I was able to talk to Shauna, Shauna, I didn't ask permission, God forgive me. She's using a similar, you know, um, framework, and that was one benefit too. I didn't know anything about Shauna's research. But finding people who are using similar framework and she's advanced, I could talk to her, learn from her, um, and identify gaps that I could fill. So when I spoke with her and I, I realized even though she used a different approach, I decided to add a compensatory, um, what we call it, elements to mine, and I hope that it will work. But thank you so much, Mary, for sharing. We do have a few more if no one in the room has yes. a question. Uh, we have a comment from Umar. He says, please tell, let Foster know about the following comment. He says, good job, Faustina. It's been rewarding having you as a colleague, accountability partner, and academic girlfriend in this journey. <laughs> Thank you, Umar. And then we have a question from Shauna Torrington. She says, greetings from the sunny Bahamas, Fausti, which it, it's currently snowing here, just so you know, Shauna. Um, how do you keep on top of finding the most recent publications and articles related to your research area? Alden Library. That's a simple answer. <laughs> but no, I, I think the biggest thing is, thanks Shona for that question. The biggest thing, and at some point I would, I'll back up. At some point I hit a writer's block, and what I realized was I wasn't constantly going back to my literature. You know, and so you have to continually check in um, for, for what's going on in terms of the research. As I also mentioned, identifying um, a conference that aligns with your topic helps. So through my gatekeeper process, I, I was able to find out that there's a small group of higher education professionals and researchers who started annual meetings on hidden populations. So I signed up for the newsletter, 
and they would constantly be sharing resources. I also participated in the research um, in the conference, and that also helped me in terms of staying abreast with my topic. Um, one thing that happened to me that I wasn't thrilled about though was there was one time I think it was in 20 early of 2021. 2020, late of 2020, I was looking for one reference, one reference, just to fix a citation and load a whole new list of articles that were published in 2020 and 2021 came up. So I ended up spending almost six months, if not more, you know, updating my literature because I, I just, I wish I didn't see them then, so I, I didn't see it, but no, I did, so and that further pushed me back, which ties back to what Mary had said, so just finding, finding ways of staying connected with professionals who are conducting research, it helps, and setting alerts on, um, on Google Scholar as well. I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, it's a fantastic presentation, and I deeply appreciate all your comments about the library, and that you enjoy those chairs. I've never been a personal favorite, so I'm glad you're here. But I'm, I just had a question about uh, your, re I think a phrase that you use in your research question, which is life-giving aspects. So I was just really struck by that. Can you say a little bit more about what that, what those words mean? Definitely. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, with the appreciative inquiry um, approach, the emphasis is to find out what aspects of um, people's experiences give them life or what do they value. So in terms of the use of that phrase and in relation to my research, what I will be asking that administrators is in providing support, for students with foster care background, what are the aspects that keep you energized? What are the aspects that are working well? What are the aspects that make you wake up every day and go back to work? Because to be honest, if you get to understand the literature of students with foster care background, they go through so much challenge, even with their transition into higher education. And for any administrator or staff who is providing that support, it does require so much more beyond your paycheck to stay in that field. And so with the proponents of the theory, they give you the opportunity to do some reflection exercise to think about you know, what is giving me life in relation to this work that I am doing or in relation to the service. Again, thank you for your presentation. And as you were talking, I just thought of this. When you were doing your research about like the youth and foster system, did you find when it comes to demographics what um, that looks like in the foster care system, especially those who come into higher education? Yes, I do have that. Um, interestingly enough, in terms of demographics, and I should have written that down, you may think that the current, based on if my memory serves me right, the current literature shows that majority of them are actually white and not necessarily what we think that people of color, even though the challenges you know, transcend across all demographics. But in, in my literature review, definitely, then from the AFCAS report, they do break it down in terms of the percentages, but from the latest one, the majority of them are white. And also, um, I think if I remember, the main reason for, I think neglect, child neglect was number one in terms of why they end up in the child welfare system. Well, I'm curious to know, and maybe you haven't probed this yet since you haven't done your interviews, but um, what have you learned from the literature about the relationship between support systems in high schools and college support systems for foster care children? Yeah, 
That's a good question. So one thing to acknowledge is that they they move schools a lot because you know family or they are in and out of schools and in and out of families, and so the the CHEO programs and the PR programs are supposed to provide that gap of support. But once again, because they are coming from a trauma informed background and the lack of awareness these programs are not adequately supporting them. For, for foster you to another big thing that I have struggled with is the fair path violation. So if they do not self-identify, it is a violation. That's why they are in this school. I didn't that delve much into high, um, high school literature, but what I know in connection to higher education and in connection into they are coming into higher post-secondary education institutions is that they come unprepared, right? They are in and out of school, they are changing families, so academically, and they are also dealing with all these psychological challenges, which sadly translates into behavioral issues as well. So there's a lot of disruptive experiences that they have to go through and corrective action because of their trauma informed background. So when you take all of this into into consideration, that's why it's so complicated and they need uh, those targeted services. And lastly what makes it really more difficult is that the the age of emancipation, the age that they are leaving the foster care system coincides with when they come into post secondary so states have advocated, initially the age was 18, that you have to be. And if you don't have a family to go to, then you're on your own. So that abrupt transition from childhood to adult impacts them so badly. And then now some states, quite a number of states have pushed, advocated for the age to move to 21. Some states are doing well, in some states it's even 23. But still, you know, when they come here, just think about some of the social programs, mom's weekends, dad's, sibs, all of that, Thanksgiving, and they are on their own. And so, and most of the time, one interesting thing I also found in the literature, which I wasn't expecting, was even some of them did not want to join these campus support programs because of the stigma. And they felt that being part of those programming further, you know, deepen the stigma because then it's so obvious that, you know, Krusty has this background. So then they wouldn't even be involved. The reason why they're seriously marginalized. So that's a good question. I didn't delve much into it, but as an inflow, you know, they are coming with the back end. It just shows there isn't much difference. Because if they are coming into higher education, you know, less prepared, academically challenged, then it, it is obvious that the high school, the K through 12 system is also a bit handicapped, or they continue to grapple with it just as high education is grappling with, with their yeah. school. It's a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any questions? No more online. Um, you mentioned data management help earlier, you said that was helpful. Can you talk more about that? Yes. I would love to. <laughs> I, no, I'll be mindful of time as well. But as I mentioned, um, I had not thought intentionally about data management. You know, because when you're when you're preparing for your research, you know, your whole focus is in putting together your design and the proposal and everything. But when I sat in that workshop, it helped me reassess what structures I'm putting in place to make sure that I am not compromising on the privacy of my participants, you know, and also thinking thoroughly in terms of the process of how I'm going to manage the data that I will collect on my participants. And, and some of the technical things and the resources that I could also use in managing the data that I will eventually collect for my um, dissertation. So I, I may have to go back to it once again, which I'm grateful that the recording is up or I have my notes because I took what was relevant for me based on my process. 
But one thing I can say for sure was how that workshop, in addition to um, the resources I had literature-wise in putting together the ethical considerations, I could put all of that and think about it from a holistic perspective and make sure that whatever I, I submitted to IRB, I covered all those um, all those pointers. I I can confidently and humbly say with my IRB, they they didn't have any feedback on my content. And it is because I was intentional in putting together everything that I submitted and because I've benefited from all these resources. The only thing that I needed to send back that kept me waiting were those four days. And so thank you. There isn't any question, and we be close enough. I, I also want to say thank you to our university leadership and to the leadership of the library, whoever thinks about the resources. For students, um, I'm so grateful that they are continuously thinking of how best they can put, best support our research and creative activity. But I also say this so that our university leadership would realize that these resources are valuable. Um, I also share this so that faculty across campus will share these resources with students. And, and lastly, also to our donors, uh, if we have them and they are ever watching, for them to know that whatever they are investing is going to good use. And we are grateful that we find ourselves in a space where we have professionals who are constantly thinking, how do we make this process you know, less burdensome for our students. For those who are here, for those who made time online, thank you once again. Thank you for this.